what frustrated me the most or kind of gave me that fire was the fact that when I was hospitalized in the mental health facility, I was not allowed to walk. I was on wheelchair rest. It was very dehumanizing. That and also, you know, having to pretty much strip down to my knickers, you weren't even allowed to wear a bra because you could put stuff in to make you weigh more. You know, my mother hasn't seen me that naked in years kind of thing. That was my lowest and I just thought, I'm not doing this anymore. Hi. So firstly, I kind of want to get into the definition of what um, BDD is. I think it would be really good if you kind of went around and, and gave your own definition of what it means to you. I think for me it means, you know, a fixation on a certain part of your body or multiple parts of your body um, that, that kind of overwhelms you, takes over your entire life sometimes. I would say it's like an obsession with certain parts of your body. So it's similar to, to what you're saying. It's an obsession and it's an obsession to change yourself as well, even at your own detriment. Yeah. You lose sight of everything else um, and it can be very toxic and very unhealthy. For me, it was a lot about my self-identity tying into this thing that I perceived wasn't right with me. So I, I didn't think I was muscular enough. I didn't feel like I looked the way I was supposed to look. And that wasn't just a, my body doesn't look right, it's I'm wrong. There's not something not right with me. That's what it meant. Yeah, for me, um, it was uh, like looking into a distorted, like looking through distorted glasses. Um, I couldn't think about anything else. It literally took every second up from my day. Um, it felt like a dark cloud came over me and weighed me down. Um, I couldn't just live, I, I, it just took every moment up. For me, it's having quite a low self-opinion um, of oneself, um, never feeling like you are enough, feeling like you've got a heavy weight attached to your ankle that you're dragging around that can really take away that spark and that happiness. And uh, yeah, it's very consuming. It was something that, you know, made me feel shameful, embarrassed, um, stopped me from living my teenage years to the fullest and kind of like robbed me of my joy quite a lot um, and was, yeah, really oppressive, um, a heaviness and obsession. Is there a specific point you can trace back to or recall when you started to become fixated on your appearance? Um, so I was 14 years old when I was diagnosed with body dysmorphic disorder. I was already diagnosed with depression and anxiety, but I had a fixation on getting a flat stomach because I was bullied for being overweight. So um, I just thought, okay, if I'm thin, I'll be happier. And in the end, it became a full-blown anorexia um, to the point where I was uh, hospitalized and I was told either, either you go in voluntarily or we'll section you. Um, I'm five foot eight, which is 170 centimeters. And at my lowest point, I weighed 33 kilos, which is less than five stone. And uh, the doctors told my parents I had two weeks to live. So the body, body dysmorphia almost killed me. I think because of my childhood experiences, just coming from a dysfunctional home, um, had an alcoholic father, um, I was searching for like my identity and I didn't really have anybody to really affirm me and kind of like say, oh, you know, you're beautiful, you know, um, you're loved and things like that um, consistently. So I think that's where that kind of self-doubt was seeping in. Um, the years progressively went on and then I believe I was about 13 and that's when I feel like things started to kick off for me because you're right in, um, you know, school and, you know, pressure, peer pressure and body image stuff, you know, seeps out. And um, that's when I started to become really obsessed with my facial features and just became really self-conscious um, and really obsessive with exercise and just consistently wanting to lose weight because I thought that if I lost a lot of weight, then my face would change. And it's just a never ending cycle, but I didn't actually understand that it was body dysmorphic disorder. So as the years went on, um, I kind of, again, was seeking validation in 
unhealthy relationships and I ended up um, getting into an emotionally abusive relationship. And as you can imagine, um, if you're with somebody that kind of just beats you down like verbally all the time, um, it can make it worse. I then developed bulimia because I was just consistently trying to lose the weight. I was really, really depressed and that continued to about the age of 21, which is well, actually 19, which is when I went to the doctors. They didn't really listen. So I went another like two, three years just battling with it and had to literally beg, you know, break down and say like, look, there's something wrong with me. I really need help. And um, for me, that's kind of when my journey began to get a lot better. And I think like my relationship with God um, as a Christian actually helped me propel forward, so. My experience with BDD started when I was uh, 14. Uh, previous to that, I'd had three or four years uh, experiencing OCD um, before I, I started suffering with BDD, but nothing really prepared me for, for the impact this illness would have on me. Just to give some context beforehand, I was, yeah, I loved playing rugby, um, I was doing well at school, um, I had friends, um, and you know, things were going really well. Um, but as soon as kind of I turned 14, my whole life started to change. I was spending hours in the mirror. Um, I just couldn't get out of it. I couldn't stop myself looking and scrutinizing and pulling myself apart. And I think that's what makes BDD so difficult. It's so individual. You're literally pulling yourself apart every single day for hours on end. And when you spend, you know, 10 hours a day in the mirror staring at yourself, um, it's gonna, gonna have an impact as I, as I found out. And unfortunately I became so unwell uh, that I had to drop out of school and uh, I became housebound for six months, um, which was probably one of the most excruciatingly painful times of my life. Um, getting up really early, 6 a.m., spending an hour in the mirror, purging my food, um, picking up my skin, moisturizing continuously, taking multiple photos of myself, scrutinizing them photos, and then repeat and repeat and repeat over and over again. Um, and I'm not embarrassed to say, you know, after, after six months of doing that every, every single day, um, you know, I, I unfortunately, try to take, take my own life. Um, and you know, it's, it's important to talk about these things. Uh, but luckily I, I, I survived, uh, evidently. Um, and from that point I started to build again, but it just shows that BDD can take away your education. It can take away your health. It can take away your entire life. Um, but I'm lucky that I got the support I needed. A lot, I resonate with so much what you were saying. And I think the yeah, there's, there's a lot of people when they think about people having body dysmorphic disorder, I think there's this idea of vanity or you just, you just want to look good and you know, it's all this kind of, I feel like there's a negative kind of connotation that comes with it, but you, you don't choose to, to do these compulsive behaviours because they're not nice. You know, when you're doing it, it's, it's really horrible. Yeah. And like, don't feel like you're alone because I would say it drove me to try and kill myself twice. So, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely in the same boat. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here, so. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> For me, so much of it revolved around masculinity and feeling like as a young boy, I needed to be a specific person when I grew up to be a man. And the way that I found that when I was younger was through rugby, similar to you, Danny. Uh, and I was the rugby guy in my school. It's all I spoke about, it's all I did. And then when I was 13, I fractured my spine playing rugby and I've got metal in it now, holding it together. And I just felt this entire loss of respect and self-worth. And I felt like who I was had just disappeared overnight when the doctor told me I wasn't allowed to play anymore. I gained a significant amount of weight whilst I was off for a year and I missed school for the whole year as well. And when I went back to school, you know, I don't think anyone bullied me, but people definitely treated me differently. 
um, from, I think partially probably just because I'd been away for a year, but for me, I attributed all that to my body image. So I started trying to lose weight. I started reading about nutrition, started reading about exercise, started um, running on treadmills and just trying to lose weight. Somehow kind of came to the fitness industry and started looking online and seeing all these fitness influencers. And every man in that world had big arms, six pack, big chest, veins, you know, everyone looked the same way. So I just accepted this is what I'm supposed to look like. And there's this kind of streak throughout that, that world, that fitness world of these masculine ideas of, are you man enough to do this? Can you take enough pain to get to this body? You know, it's, it's all on you. The onus is all on you to be tough enough and strong enough and push yourself. Um, and it got to the point where I failed enough times. I couldn't do the, the workout. I, you know, couldn't stick to the diet or even just the workout wasn't ha as successful as it had been the week before. And whenever that happened, I had that overwhelming sense of lack of self-worth and it's because I'm a failure that I can't do this and just led to this locking myself away and just feeling bad about myself. Um, and that happened enough times and for long enough that I basically accepted that I, it wasn't worth me being here and that people around me would have a, it would be a better world if I didn't exist because everyone that I followed on Instagram could do this every day and I couldn't. Um, I'm not personally religious myself, but um, I always think this was such an amazing coincidence or whatever it was, maybe it was some kind of divine thing, but one of my best friends at uni came to my house on the day that I was gonna do it. Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, and yeah, and that I've kind of never looked back since really. I, she, I broke down in tears in front of her and she told me that I should speak to someone and I ended up getting a counsellor. Ironically, I worked as a personal trainer whilst I was getting counselling, even though I you know, was really struggling with my eating and my exercise myself. Um, yeah, I've done a full story there, but <laughs> uh, yeah. I think it's really interesting what you said between, and I don't know if everyone else feels like this, this kind of division between success and failure, right? Mm -hmm. We put so much emphasis on the way we look. You know, if you go on Instagram, you go on Twitter, you go on Facebook, if that's still a thing, I'm not sure it is. <laughs> I feel like an old person saying that, but um, you know, there's so much emphasis on how you look, getting them likes, you yeah. know, and we do associate with success and failure. I don't know what everyone else feels yeah. about that. I thought that my life would be so much better if I looked a certain way. Yeah. And actually, I got to that point and I was miserable. I'd never been that low in my life. I feel like that's the cruelty of body dysmorphia because it's like a vicious cycle. And until that cycle is broken, it's like you're going to be stuck in that loop. Like, you know, um, and it's the obsession with obviously the outward appearance. Um, however, I think something that I've been able to learn, especially like linking to my faith, is that I feel like the character is what lasts longer. So everything within yourself is what's going to last longer, you know, because anything can happen overnight. Something can ha happen to your physical looks and things like that. And if that's what you're built on, it's not a firm foundation. Um, so I think as I've kind of like grown older and, and healed, that's kind of something that's really kept me grounded. So I would say it was a gradual process. It wasn't just like it just happened overnight. Um, I actually suffer with OCD as well. Um, have done since I was eight um, and I'd say when I was around 16 it got on top of me. I didn't really know what B BDD was, I thought it was about being skinny if I'm being honest, I didn't, that's sort of a stereotype. I just knew that I had this preoccupation, I fell into this compulsion of filming myself um, beauty of having an iPhone, well, not really, is that it's there 24 seven. And it became this compulsion where I would film myself up to 50 times a day and then rewatch it and analyze every single frame. Um, and there was a particular day, it was actually my prom. Um, I filmed myself again, um, all my family were gonna come around and as you do, I was with my, all my friends and I couldn't go, I had a really massive panic attack. Um, I just thought I looked disgusting and horrible. Um, and then during, I'd say that was like, that was in 2019, um, end of 2019, it got really bad. And then COVID happened. Um, like we were all uh, locked inside. I had all that time uh, to film myself, to look in the mirror. It just got worse and worse and worse um, to the point where 
I couldn't even be around my family. I would hide my face with hoodies and makeup. Um, I started to use, I would go on social media and compare myself to everyone. Um, I would even search up celebrities without makeup on and screenshot them. And I was, would kept, compare myself constantly. Um, I would search up plastic surgeries to get. Um, I had an app on my iPad where um, I had a picture of myself and I was drawing all the surgeries I wanted to have done on my face. Um, and then there was one night that I just completely had enough and uh, that was the first time I had a suicidal thought. Um, and I felt really guilty about it. That was the biggest thing. Um, and the thought of telling someone scared me. Um, and I just felt like my parents would worry, obviously. Um, so I couldn't do that. My BDD was centered around my face um, and my nose, especially, and my jawline. And I thought the only way I can control this is losing weight. So that's what I did. I restricted, um, starved myself. I lost two stone within six months, I think. Um, but it was never enough. It just got worse and worse. Um, and then I was in therapy for my OCD at the time. Um, and I thought, I'm just, I just have to, have to talk about it. I was really embarrassed, but I just had to talk about it. And I did with my therapist. And she said that, that sounded like BDD. Um, I, was, I was relieved because it was like, there's something like, in my head. It was, I was just ugly. I was disgusting. There's, I'm not ill. There's, there's not an illness. I'm just disgusting. Um, and she directed me to the BDD Foundation. Um, which is where everything changed really for me. Uh, I realised it's it's I have to do the same thing I do to beat OCD with BDD, um, which was starving the beast, not giving to it, cut out the compulsion of filming myself, which was the hardest thing to do. Um, but as I did that, I realised I wasn't grabbing the phone as often. I wasn't even thinking about it as often. Um, and I did ERP, which was terrifying and awful, but is the best thing that I ever did. I met a community on Instagram, um, people sharing their experiences like you um, have really helped me. Um, I think that's the biggest thing that's helped me really is knowing there's other people going through it. Because um, you feel so alone and I felt so alone. I was always that awkward kid. I was really a loner. And as time's gone on and I've I've had my therapies in later life and I've reflected back. I've always been that highly sensitive boy. And with being highly sensitive comes that real awareness. I pick up everything, energies, I read people, I, I know how to adapt, I know when to remove myself. I know if someone's in pain, I almost feel, like feel their pain. And that's, it's, it's a good thing, but also it can really wear you down. But I've always been that guy that's aware. Um, but my younger life, I was very much a loner. I didn't have many friends. I didn't really want many friends. I was just in my own little bubble and that's my safe space. But obviously, as we get older, we have to start venturing out our comfort zones and school was a very turbulent place for me as I got into secondary school. Bullying, always being that target because I was always on my own. And if there was an opportunity to go home at lunch, I'd go home with a low self-esteem already now because I'd had a quite a rough time, I was really anxious and the anxiety was there and oh my God, I've got to fit in again and this is, I just wanted to be homeschooled or I didn't want to do school. I made a friend and he was very similar to me in the sense of uh, loved his music and he was theatrical and quite camp and he was a little bit of a target himself. But I really resonated with him. And so I just stuck with him, but then that made us both the targets because I was the new boy. He'd already built up a bit of a reputation for not being one of the typical lads in an all boys school. And there started a whole new wave of bullying, always being called the gay boys. And back then at school, which is 20 plus years ago now, that was like one of the worst things to be called. You didn't want to be called that. And if word got around that you might be a Nancy boy or you know, you're not one of the lads, you were the target. So the cycle started again, and this low self-esteem was always there. Weirdly, The Only Way is Essex, which is a reality TV show, hit. 
And I became obsessed with that show. It was bizarre to me what it was. Everyone was talking about it. It was this new genre of TV, structured reality. I identified with a lot of the guys on the show in the sense of what my life was, but I thought, oh my God, wow, these are like, these guys are cool. And I became really fixated on the show, as a lot of us were. And um, any TOWIE fans, no? Yeah. No. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, it really was a big thing. They were basically looking for locations to film in. And I rocked up, and long, 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 long story short, they met me. One of the producers really liked me and found me interesting. Three months later, I get a call and they say, uh, would you like to come and uh, meet one of our exec producers? We think you could be quite interested in coming on the show. Like, tell us more about you. My whole life just changed overnight because by what I've said, I was always in a bubble and I was always very in control of my bubble. And when I got the opportunity to go on the show, there was that element of, oh my God, this is gonna be a moment for me. Everything that I've idolized and wanted maybe quietly in a fantasy has just come through my door and I'm gonna give it a go. And I wanted to feel like what these guys were living the dream. I wanted that, so I did it. And with that came hundreds of thousands of people following you on Twitter was the thing at the time. Everyone had an opinion on you. Everyone was talking about you. The show was done in a way that we would film it and two days later it would be out for the public to watch. It was such a quick turnaround. What it did do was it put my image and how I saw myself right at the forefront because I was in this very unique bubble. It was very competitive. Everyone wanted to look a certain way. There was this high glossy approach that everyone wanted to have that perfection, the bodies, the tan becoming obsessive about fake tan, um, muscles, getting the photo shoots, looking at, they'd run polls about who your favorite cast member was. And if you ranked low, I'd see it and I'd be like, oh my God, like, why people don't like me? And it brought back all those feelings of that young boy that didn't feel liked or wanted. So what can I do? I need to up my game. I need to get this pressure on me and I wanna be one of these. I wanna be like the best because I always had that in my, in my head. People were like, he's gay, he's gay, he's gay. Um, so after a couple of years on the show and the constant scrutiny of being on, on that, I decided that I needed to remove myself because I was getting very unhappy, obsessing about myself before filming, looking at myself in the mirror, going to social media, needing the selfies, the validation, um, just constantly in that cycle. And it's draining as we all know, it's, it's, it's never ending. And in that period, that's when I did I identify with my sexuality. I met a guy and I did come out as gay. I came out live on this morning. It was again under the glare of the media, but I felt like people had followed my story for such a long time that it was only right that I then gave them my truth and my struggles with identifying with myself. But then with that and my nature embarked on this whole new chapter because I was now 30 years old, just come out never had a relationship in my life, never had intimate relations in my life. And all of a sudden I'm this gay guy in the public eye and I thought I needed to be Mr. Jacked Up Muscles physique because I didn't want to be seen as less than the man that, you know, I wanted to be seen as Mr. Masculine still because there was this, this internal homophobia, I would say, towards myself. And so I went on that mission and it was all about the magazines of looking at all these guys that had the washboard stomachs and the big muscles and the tats. And hence, I did all of this. I went on this total rebrand. We go into that COVID period. And during that COVID period, I was on my own, which was a dangerous thing I didn't realize at the time, but I thought that's what I needed to do. But in that year window, when we were all housebound, the mirror, the social media became the enemy to the point where it was hours every day looking at myself, getting a pencil, drawing on my nose. And I became obsessed with my nose that I felt like I had to change it because it was still too big for my face. It had a dent in it. Um, if I've been this successful up to this point with this face, imagine what it'd be like if I was totally confident with that straight masculine nose. As soon as we came out of that first lockdown, I go to Harley Street, I go and see a top surgeon. He looks at my face, he says, your nose is too big for your face. Proportion wise, you're a good looking boy, but the nose, we can make you better. I was like, yes, you validated my insecurity there. Sign me up, get me on that table, fix my nose. 
no real duty of care to that apart from, yeah, you can make me better because I was in a vulnerable place. And so I did, I did the surgery. The surgery went wrong and the surgery was a disaster. And there started a whole new chapter, but I think I'll leave it there for the minute. But it got me to the point of plastic surgery without any real intervention. And I was about to embark on a chapter then, which was where it all came to light and why I'm sitting here today. A few of you have mentioned that, like, I suppose BDD is often linked with or, or confused with like eating disorders or other mental health conditions. And do you think you could kind of like talk about how they might interact? For me personally, um, I was diagnosed with depression and that obviously you, I felt such a low kind of self-esteem, low self-worth. Why am I here? Why was I born? I don't sort of deserve to exist. And then that sort of fueled the fire that became BDD because I would then look at myself and it was almost like looking in the mirror validated all those things that I'm not worthy and that kind of thing. That kind of triggered me into, okay, maybe my life will be better. Maybe I won't be so depressed if I lose weight. And then my focus was on my stomach and my thighs because I thought they were too big. Um, and even at a size zero, I thought I had thunder thighs. I thought my stomach was, you know, like that of a whale. So for me, my mental illnesses really contributed to getting BDD because I had no self-esteem. I had no self-worth and also being diagnosed, it's, it can be quite triggering being told that you're going to be on tablets for the rest of your life because you have a lack of serotonin. That in itself is a lot to take on at the age of 14. So for me, my mental health kind of fueled the fire, but I know it's not the case for everyone. I just, it's exhausting even thinking about it. It's almost like trying to, being surrounded and trying to fight on all fronts. Um, and, and continuously just being bombarded with different emotions. I, I, I remember when I was experiencing BDD, just, just feeling differently every single day. You know, one day I felt really anxious, the next day I'd be really depressed, probably because I'd zoomed in on my appearance or, you know, and, and the next day I'd be purging my food, which could be linked to an eating disorder. It wasn't, but it could be linked to an eating disorder. So yeah, it's, it's so complex. I don't know if everyone else feels that way too. Like, actually understanding it yourself and getting your head around it is, is very difficult. I think for me, OCD makes me really anxious and I have to do the compulsions to sort of stop that anxiety feeling. Whereas with the BDD, I just felt so sad and depressed. And like I said before, a weight is just on me and pulling me down. I just cried all the time. There was like a difference um, between the OCD and the BDD. I think with eating disorders, I think, um, you can have an eating disorder and have BDD. And I think that's where people get sort of confused is that BDD is a separate illness. Um, just like OCD is to BDD. They can be very similar and they can, have, they can sort of intertwine with each other, but they're separate. Some researchers saying that it should actually be a form of eating disorder um, because some people's experiences, the eating actually is the primary issue. I think that muscle dysmorphia itself exists in that idea that the, the criteria within the diagnostic statistical manual says that it can't be aligned with body fat and it can't be kind of aligned with disordered eating or, or eating distress. Um, and I think that exists for some people. For, for me personally, mine did align with body fat and mine did align with eating distress. Because I was so obsessed with trying to lose weight, um, I would literally restrict myself from eating and you know on days where I was super hungry like I'm you know going out with friends and then coming home and I'm throwing up in the bathroom nobody knows what I'm doing and stuff like that and um, it was because I was so obsessed with wanting to lose the weight and then feeling the guilt of just eating food I felt so guilty and I thought oh my gosh I'm you know my progress is gonna you know be destroyed if I eat a plate of food when you know it's probably just like a fraction of my daily intake, um, but the guilt was always there. So I feel like they they were simultaneously happening at the same time, but I definitely believe that body, body dysmorphia was the first thing that I was experiencing, and I do think they're quite separate. Mm. Do you think it's a common thread that we all need this element of control on what we're doing? Absolutely. And we have to be consumed by that control to almost tell ourselves that 
we are in control of what we're doing and we're actually okay. The issue with me, I don't know if any of you guys suffer from this, but I've got an acute case of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's kind of like, um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all like interlinked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah because, yeah. you know, if, if I achieve a certain level of something, then I'll be happy, then I'll be successful, when actually you're chasing the impossible. Because mm -hmm. as humans, we are not perfect. We're never going to be. I think that's a bit of like about BDDs. Also, it's not just about how you look at self-image, it's how mm. you like, see it, how you come across. And uh, for me, I also fixated on like, um, education. And if I didn't yeah. reach a certain point, I was so angry with myself. And I thought people it would, it's, it's, it is the image. It's like, how do people perceive you? And I had to be perceived in a good way. And it's interesting how it intertwines with OCD as well. Like, you know, talking about perfectionism, like, you know, I'll spend an extra two hours in the office, I work 16 hours a day because I just think mm -hmm. I'm trying to get that goal. I want to be the best. I want to do better th than everyone else. Um, and, and that's really hard. And then when you apply that to your image, mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's horrific. It's, it's you literally, because you're never going to be perfect. You're never going to reach it. Every time you look in that mirror, I think someone said earlier that you're, you're almost searching for the problem mm -hmm. yeah. that's not there. If there's not a problem, you'll make it a problem. For me, it was back in 2013. I didn't really have social media like that. And um, it wasn't something heard of, I think, when I was growing up as a teenager, whereas now. It's such a serious mental health issue that we... It's a, it's a term that shouldn't really kind of like be thrown around. And I feel like um, when I was diagnosed, it was by a psychiatrist. So, um, not to say that people can't kind of like um, identify with the symptoms, but I think it's also really important to go to the GPs, even though that's another story, um, <laughs> or your doctors or whatever, to try and get a diagnosis um, so that you can get the right help and not kind of like assume that you have it just because you, you might link to other people's experiences and stuff. Like I, I get what you're saying because I feel like now in the age of social media, yeah. especially like with TikTok and stuff, people are like self-diagnosing yeah. and yeah. then they start making videos about, oh, I definitely have this, when actually you do need to go through the correct kind of avenues and get a proper diagnosis. When I was anorexic, I was told that I was too fat to be anorexic, but I had all of the patterns and, and you know because it's a psychological disorder that then presents itself as physical but talking about like people just throwing these words around they also they use it as an adjective like mm. my, you know especially with OCD and yeah. stuff is that I'm so OCD that makes no sense I'm so obsessive compulsive disorder mm. <laughs> um so it's like and it's so easily it's sort of like slang now it's like with all these different mental illnesses and um, it shouldn't get to the point where it's glamorized. It should get to the point where it's made aware, so it helps people. Um, but I do feel like there is a toxic side, especially on TikTok, where it is 100% glamorized. Um, yeah. There's nothing glamorous about this. I mean, <laughs> no. we all agree. Like, when you actually experience this illness, there is nothing glamorous. There is nothing glamorous about visiting a, a psych ward. No. It's I have reoccurring nightmares of doing it. Like, I actually, <laughs> yeah, that terrifies me. It's because when you're all that ill, when you know, there's a part yeah. of you that know that. I could potentially be there, it terrifies you to your core. I read a statistic that men are about 40% of people that have BDD. Do you think there's a difference in the way that like men and women perceive it or that you're treated if you're a man versus yeah. a woman? Yeah, I, I think, number one, I think there's like a double stigma with, with men. Uh, I never thought I'd say this, but you know, Men are, men are underrepresented in this, in, in this, in this specific area. Um, it's not normally the case in most areas, but you know, there is that double stigma. I remember when I started talking about it, it's interesting you mentioned a boys' school, because I went to a boys' school as well. Uh, you know what it's like. I do. You know, talking about, I'm worried about the way I look, or you know, I'm worried that my nose is too big, or I'm worried that my hairline's receding and saying that to your mates or walking into the rugby changing room and saying, you know, I'm worried about my weight. The abuse you get, I mean, it's, it's horrific. I, I think one of the hardest things is, is just feeling like you shouldn't be experiencing these emotions. You shouldn't be having these concerns about the way you look and you definitely shouldn't be getting treatment because you're a man. When I finally came through my plastic surgery ordeal, and I'd gone off radar, I'd come off of the socials, people were wondering where I was and whatever it was. I just didn't want to be seen. I bumped into someone who, who gave me the opportunity to go on to 
a, a morning talk show. And I did, and I went and basically said, this is where I'm at, this is why I've disappeared for a while, and I had this surgery, and it, the version of events, should we say. The aftermath to that feature that we did and me having that candid conversation, I was overwhelmed by the amount of men that came my way, and not just men part of my community within the LGBTQ+, but just men that must have caught a clip of it or seen it and that have reached out to me and, and feel this shame mm -hmm. that they have this, this low self-esteem or they can't vocalise that they're seeing themselves in a certain way because it just seems less of a... It's not a masculine thing to talk about or it's, it's not a conversation that you're going to sit over the, the beer with and talk to your mate in the pub. And that... that, that like side of the like it's not masculine to talk about it i think that that also means that you a lot of men or at least for myself we don't have the words to explain it a lot of the time because we don't hear other men talking about their body image issues or struggling with the way they look other than you know i work i went into like the bodybuilding world and in that world everyone talks about how much they dislike their body but it's in this way of Everyone talks about iron therapy and you're lifting weights so you're getting better, but no one ever spoke about it with the context of maybe you're not getting better. Um, and also like kind of on this subject of the, the gender differences, I think with muscle dysmorphia and mus muscle issues, I'm kind of seeing the other, the other stereotype coming in that everyone who talks about it only mentions men. And there are, there are women who, and any gender, who also experience this idea of muscularity. You know, fitspiration for women is such a huge thing now. It's like marketing. It's the fact that when you watch these adverts on the TV or you see these m magazines, whether you're, a, no matter what your gender, you're going to look at something that captures your eye and you want to almost look at that and be that. And you want to feel it because it's kind of sold to you that if you're like that, you're going to live this like powerful ultimate life. And men, especially, by default, are quite competitive. They're very, you know, it's a pack thing. You want to be that really good looking guy with the good looking partner and the beautiful kids if you so wish to want kids. And you want to have that powerful job. And you want to have the good hair and smell good. It, it's this whole thing. And if you're not that, or you, you're, you, you're looking at other people that are, that's where I think as well that the feelings can be very valid for men. We have actual numerical evidence now of, of whether or not people that kind of um, are positive towards the way you look. You know, and, and the, the issue is that it isn't actually necessarily linking to actually how attractive they think you might be. Some people just like for the sake of it. But for me, how many, num how many numbers I got below my picture directly linked to how good of a person I was that week. I, I think we do have a responsibility and I've I've tried to use my social media for good mm. uh, to show that there are two sides of the same coin and it's not all roses and, you know, I'll post pictures that I don't even like of myself because I'm, I want to be real. Mm. You know, I'll do a no makeup selfie, even though I know that I feel vulnerable doing it, but then I know that it's not natural to wear makeup yeah. every day for, you know, 12 hours a day or whatever. And that's the same with filters, I think. Yeah. Like, I've been very mindful of not using filters. In fact, actually, weirdly, during my BDD, when I was really bad, I actually would post without filters, because then I thought, that's my real self, that's how I get validation. Mm. Um, but I also think now, like this day and age, especially on TikTok, the filters just look so real, and you don't really know if it's real or not. So people just scrolling down are going to think, oh, that's why am I not like that? Why do I not look like that? Um, so I make it a very conscious effort. I don't use filters because, like you said, it's just being real. Like, I'm human. I have pores. I have discoloration and texture, which is a normal human mm. thing. And it should be celebrated rather than be fixed. Like, nobody has smooth skin. That's just not a reality. I think yeah. I um, definitely agree with what you're saying, like authenticity, mm. embracing imperfections. I think that is where um, the change happens because I think if you can show up as your authentic self, okay, yeah, you have the imperfections. And you being able to walk in that vulnerability, which is not hard, it takes courage to do that. Mm. But I think when you show up as your authentic self, just owning who you are and how you are, it allows others to be able to do the same. And I think that's literally like a central message that I try to, yeah. um, you know, share with others because 
yeah, there's power in that. Mm. Yeah. I want to talk now about um, your individual journeys to recovery, starting maybe at your lowest point and the decision that you made to, to seek help or what helped you move on um, and start to take those steps. Sure. Whenever I couldn't stick to my diet or my exercise or whatever it was that I was doing, I used to lock myself away in my room because I was so ashamed of people seeing me behaving in that way. Or I just, so I felt like people would be able to visually see that I wasn't doing what I was doing, even for if it was for an hour. And yeah, that kind of spiraled to me just not speaking to anyone and just spiraling on these emotions and these behaviors and again to the point where I was suicidal and planning on on doing it and I was very fortunate that my friend Cara came on the day that I was planning on taking my own life and she spoke to me and, and I ended up kind of breaking down crying with her in my living room um, and I ended up hiring a counsellor, I worked as a personal trainer ironically uh, uh, to hire a private counsellor and worked with him uh, weekly and the big thing that we spoke about for one was I had this good George and bad George and the good George was this one that I showed everyone where I got all the best marks in, at uni, I um, exercised all the time, I stuck to this diet, I looked really great as, I, as far as I was concerned um, and it just was that and then whenever I couldn't stick to these very rigid behaviours I was the bad George and I hid that away from everyone and the big thing that he used to always talk about was I had to become this other version of George which was these two kind of combined together and recognising that other people you know, aren't going to just hate me if I can't do everything perfectly. Uh, well, I did this podcast with a psychologist, um, Amy Oziki, her name was, I I've always pronounce her last name wrong, so I'm sorry, Amy. Um, but she always said that, she said, she's speaking about athletes, but I think it aligns with me as well, that uh, athletes who struggle with their mental health, they tend to build a pillar and they put their, their body image and their athletic ability on this base. And then when they get injured or something goes wrong, the whole pillar comes crashing down. And instead what people need to build and what I started to build was a pyramid. And I found all these other aspects of myself that I could respect about myself and like about myself and love about myself. And then if my body doesn't look how I want it to look that day, I can take it away and the pyramid's still standing. Yeah, so I, I remember when I hit my rock bottom, uh, it, was a, it was a rainy day in Newcastle, would you believe it? And uh, I was, I just lay on my bed and I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, you know, it almost felt like I was just being constantly battered by waves um, for every hour of every day. I couldn't spend 10 hours in the mirror anymore. I couldn't, um, you know, take that many photos and rip myself apart. I couldn't purge my food. I was really weak. Um, and I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. It just, it's just, you know, it had to all end. Um, and I remember being in the, the accident and emergency department actually afterwards and, and, you know, feeling like I had a second chance um, to, to, you know, to kind of make things better. And there's, you know, there's nothing like being in an accident and emergency department on a Friday night to make you think, think about things. Um, and luckily, um, ironically, both my parents are mental health professionals. Um, handy, they must have seen me coming. Um, and I managed to get in contact with the Maudsley in London. And, uh, and, and I went down there uh, for 12 sessions of, of support. I was very lucky to get that. Um, and, you know, I remember doing loads of exposure tasks. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorites was walking down Lewisham High Street with my hair all messed up and, you know, wearing scraggy clothes, like my worst nightmare. And there was one day just suddenly I, I realized no one's looking at me. No one cares how I'm looking or no one's fixating on that, that little spot I've got on the side of my, on my, on my face. No one sees it. It's only me that, 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 that sees it. And I think slowly but surely from that, I started to build um, kind of resilience against my BDD. My lowest moment um, was this one night where I pretty much almost stopped crying in my room, not being able to sleep. Um, and it's the thoughts I had were dangerous and I was really scared. Um, I even remember looking back at my notebook where I would write such horrible things about myself. Just, you know, just, I'm ugly, I'm this horrible, disgusting person. Um, when I video myself and I'm crying videoing myself, I, I think that was probably the lowest part because it's a video of myself and I'm crying.
because of the video that I'm taking of myself. It, and it, to other people, it just, it sounds ridiculous. Um, I needed help, so I got the help I needed because luckily I was in therapy for OCD. But the thing that really helped me was, a bit like you, um, exposure therapy. Um, going out the house without any makeup on, um, not curling my hair, wearing clothes that weren't really put together, things like that. Um, and finding a community on Instagram, especially. Um, finding the BDD Foundation completely changed the game for me. Um, I'm so thankful that I really don't think I'd be here actually um, if they weren't here. Um, that's the importance of advocacy, the importance of there being resources out there, knowing that there's so many people feeling how I felt at my lowest moment right now. It's, it's, it makes me angry, it makes me sad, it makes me want to, to talk about, scream about it, and um, that helps me as well, speaking about my experiences, and I will continue doing that. Um, yeah. I think my turning point was um, going to have cognitive behavioural therapy at the Maudsley as well. Mm. Um, we did a lot of exposure therapy, um, which was super scary, because I think for me, that was my last resort. I'm like, if this therapy doesn't work for me, then I'm finished. Um, but I'm so grateful that it actually did. And then I actually became a Christian, so I gave my life to Jesus. And I think my faith has been a solid foundation for me, which I've been able to really understand and find identity in. And that has really kept me grounded, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, but also in that finding my purpose and being able to utilize um, the things that I've gone through um, to actually empower and speak to others and actually find that level of community um, so that others can be free as well. Because I think I didn't have that um, when I was suffering. I thought it was just me. And so I always believe that you don't go through um, the suffering um, without it turning into something great. When you have body dysmorphic disorder, it doesn't feel like there's any way out. You feel quite stuck. Um, but we're all sitting here today, you know, there's a camera rolling um, and that shows that there is a possibility and there is hope for the future. And so I think I've been able to find purpose and um, joy in being able to heal, but then also be able to share that with others, which keeps me going. I went through the plastic surgery journey, which obviously didn't go to plan. And that was the biggest wake up call because I had this idea of what it was going to do for me. And I put all my trust into this amazing doctor that was going to make me feel the best I have ever felt. And obviously it went totally the wrong way. But in what you've just said, like through those hardships and, and that lesson that I've had to learn, it really made me stop and think, hang on a minute, this is out of control. And now I've gone to the point of having plastic surgery that's not given me the result that I wanted. And it's not even just the fact that I didn't like what I saw, there were issues with what he had done and the healing process and whatever. So there it was on my face, I had to live with it. And I thought, what, what do I do now? Because I can't cut it off and I can't do anything anytime soon to rectify it. So I have to live with the choices and the decisions that I've made. I got the opportunity to speak publicly, which then opened up that whole floodgate of people coming forward to me, which again, shows that we're not alone and that's powerful. Mm -hmm. I felt reassured. I, I do have still moments where I can't believe I did that because I've got a vlog because I was going to record my whole process of plastic surgery and how it changed my life. Well, it did, but not in the way I wanted it to. And I look at the guy that's filming the morning of his first surgery, and I look at him and I'm like, why would you even touch your face? That is absolutely fine. And that was a pivotal moment when I was then sitting there with my bandages on after having a third uh, surgery, thinking, oh my God, I need to, this guy is, is he, he, I need to find him again. I need to find the guy that actually, is more than just about a nose or his image. We're in a very fortunate position that we can sit here strong and come together collectively and find these common denominators and that will really help people. So there is such a light in, that comes from these dark places and I think that's just really reassuring. So that's, I keep that in the back of my mind, even when the demon starts creeping in, 
And as we all know, it creeps in from time to time. So that's where I'm at. I just finished my AS levels and I said to my parents, okay, I'm going to get better. I'm going to defeat the anorexia. And I started going from, I would say, 300 to 500 calories a day to just eating 500 plus just for dinner. So I was really committed. However, there's something that happens when you're starved so long. It's called the refeeding syndrome. So your body doesn't know what to do with all this energy that you're giving it. So you start losing weight dramatically. So um, I was then, I was under CAMS um, and they said, either you go to hospital voluntarily or we'll section you. So I was in general hospital for 10 days where I lost about seven kilos, even though I was on bed rest. There was finally a place for me at a mental health facility in Oxford, which is about 60 miles away from where I live. Um, and I had to be an inpatient. And I think my lowest point was when I was checked in. So I used to keep, uh, I used to take pictures of myself because I was so angry at the anorexia and what it's robbing from me. So I have these pictures from when I was my sickest. And what, what frustrated me the most or kind of gave me that fire was the fact that when I was hospitalized in the mental health facility, I was not allowed to walk. I was on wheelchair rest. So even if I wanted to use the bathroom, I had to wait for a nurse to take me in a wheelchair. I was pretty much, I was not allowed to stand up. I had to sit down at all times. It was very dehumanizing. That and also, you know, having to pretty much strip down to my knickers, you weren't even allowed to wear a bra because you could put stuff in to make you weigh more. So see, you know, being treated by doctors and they're seeing you in your most vulnerable state when, you know, even, you know, my mother hasn't seen me that naked in years kind of thing. That was my lowest. And I just thought, I'm not doing this anymore. I do sometimes look in the mirror and think, mm, you know, but then I, I don't let it hold me back because I'm like, the alternative is where you were when you were 16, going back to the mental health facility, being that ill, you know, I'm kinder to myself. Again, I don't know if I'll ever love myself. That is a journey I'm exploring through therapy and such, but I accept myself, I forgive myself, and things could always be worse. And now, you know, I've helped so many people through doing media appearances and writing articles about my journey that it would be very disingenuous to, to go back to that. Um, there's not a lot of um, stories about women of colour who have, you know, had mental health problems or eating disorders and such. And I don't want anyone to go through what we've all been through. You know, it's so inspiring about all of you guys. You know, you've all used your experience to then help others. Like every single thing that you've done has inevitably prevented someone else from experiencing the same things. Honestly, it's amazing, so well done. What would be the, the early signs to look for in yourself or in a loved one um, that they might be, they might have BDD or developing BDD and, and any advice you'd give to those people? Muscle dysmorphia is kind of a, a maybe special case to some degree with this, to, uh, at least in the, I think the, the type of person um, that we see in the research in muscle dysmorphia that people tend to kind of lean in towards, and obviously I don't want to stereotype, but at least from the averages we see, um, there's this idea of vulnerable narcissism. Vulnerable narcissism is where someone deep down feels that they're not worth it, they're not, they're not enough. With, I suppose with body image things in, in general, people think about vanity, people think about you just want to look attractive, but trying to look past that and recognise that for some people this is all their insecurities manifesting in something that you then define as they just think they're the best. And that's really, really tough to, to spot, but something that people need to be kind of careful of. And then obviously with muscle dysmorphia, there's the compulsive exercise behaviors and kind of pulling yourself away from social situations, not going to parties and, and things because you're, you, need to, you feel like you need to exercise. And people in schools often have told me, there's one story that, um, a teacher told me where they went on a school trip to France and they had an hour window where the kids were allowed to like explore Paris. And one of the kids and a, a few of the boys Googled where the gym was, the nearest gym, and went and trained for the hour. Um, you know, I'd, obviously I don't want to say that they definitely have muscle dysmorphia, but those are the kind of signs where, you know, it's that desperation. That I've finally got a moment, I have to do this. And um, those kind of things are stuff people need to look out for. 
I think also being a fitness professional as well and being around people that are obviously trying to improve themselves, they come into the gym and they think that you know, you're going to help them achieve the goal. Um, I've come up against so many people that you'll say something like, you're looking good today or you know, you're looking stronger or some positive chat and the first thing they do is, no, absolutely not, or they'll pick out the floor. There's one person I know that, you, you know, it's before you've even said hello, I've got a terrible spot on my face and I, I just, they need to highlight it first before you even engage in a conversation because that's obviously on their mind that they've got that and they're aware of it. So what I try and do now and what I try and tell people to do is when someone gives a bit of a negative response to how they're feeling or how they're looking is, I don't just flippantly say, oh, you look fine, you're good. I try now and use it as a way to actually stop and actually give that person that moment or bank it in my head and think, right, I'm going to come back to this with you and just make sure that you're okay because I've got that awareness. I didn't think I had a problem until my brother pointed it out and he said, you're punishing yourself for eating a piece of fruit. Like, what's going on? And then he told my mum and my mum got me an appointment and the doctor said, OK, yeah, you've got BDD, you've got anorexia, that kind of thing. So talk. Like, even if you think that it's all in your head and you're making things up, no, just talk. It's always better. And, and that doesn't have to necessarily be family. I mean, there are members of my family who just absolutely wouldn't understand because in our community, mental health doesn't exist, you know. So sometimes it's friends, sometimes it's peers, sometimes it's a stranger who just notices something about you, like you said. I would say preoccupation. If you're spending a lot of time looking at yourself in way, one way or another, another um, I mean, it sort of that sort of thing. Um, I'd say maybe talk to someone, like you said. Um, but it's the time spent, I think, on your appearance. And it, that goes into how much you think about it as well, not just looking in the mirror or taking photos. It's the, the mental side of it. Um, I mean, I spent pretty much 24 hours a day thinking about it. It showed up in my dreams. And um, I think that's something to look out for. I think patience as well. Like, if you think your child or someone is experiencing, you know, body image difficulties, whatever they may be, whether it be BDD or not, just having that patience to listen to them and not get frustrated. Again, going back to the whole backstory thing and how my, my bullying and that low self-esteem really was the, the version of events that led to BDD and this, this real struggle with my mental health in general. I think if we can get into the schools and in, into like those um, environments, of like educational environments early on when the, when the kids are impressionable and teach them about whether it's the filters and marketing and what they see might not be real or if they are having, showing symptoms of eating disorders or affected by their body image and its, it's impact on their mental health, then starting those conversations early or at least letting them understand to a point that what the help could be or where they could access help and support, I think could be a real game changer in the long run. It's amazing to hear all that, guys. One more question. You could say something to your younger self. What would it be? I would say to my younger self that you were just a kid and it's not your fault and just things get better. Your life, you know, 14 years later is pretty damn amazing. And just... Maybe don't love yourself because you're not there yet, but learn to accept yourself for who you are and everything's gonna be okay. That's, I just, you know, I'm doing some work in therapy um, and I just really wanna go to my 16 year old self and give her a massive hug. I'd say just, just be you. Um, I think it's, it's e uh, easier said than done, I'd say. Um, Cause I wasn't me. It, but, 16 years old, you mentioned a robot. I, I think I was a robot, you know, I felt like that. I was so routined, everything was out of control. Um, and just try and enjoy your childhood. I think that, that would be the, the thing, yeah. Best made plans. <laughs> I think I would say to my younger self that you're enough. Mm. And that's it, you're enough. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Absolutely. Um, I think that if I looked at my younger self, I would 
probably say don't be the island that you think you need to be. You just haven't found your right people. And you shouldn't ever let anyone dull your spark because there are people out there that want to see you shine. And just because I was being maybe put into situations that were difficult for me at times and that wasn't letting me be my true self, I, I would just like to give you that reassurance, Charlie, that your right people are out there and they're going to make you shine and you're going to have a great life. So just buckle up. It's going to be bumpy, but it will be good. I actually, part of my therapy was hanging up little pictures of little me and sticking them up everywhere. Um, and she said to say the stuff that you say to yourself to that picture. And it just made me cry because that little girl, I would never, ever say that. I wouldn't want her to feel the way that I was making myself feel. Um, so I literally just say that you're beautiful and amazing and that's not about your appearance, that's just who you are as a person. Um, and give her the biggest hug. Um, and also probably tell her to you know, not wear too many Disney princess outfits out, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I would do. I'm kind of struggling with this. I had so much time to think of it, but I feel like a, something I was so obsessed with when I was younger, when I was struggling with this stuff, was that I thought everyone else knew how life worked and knew how you're supposed to do all these things to feel good about yourself and it just came natural to everyone. I thought everyone just got it and I was just this confused and scared person that was latching on to whatever he could to try and prove that he was something. I guess I would tell myself that no one's got it figured out and, and that's okay.